Hey guys, Coyote here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to what I'm calling Yodi Institute of Technology Introductory to Dwarf Fortress. Uh, it is going to be a tutorial style um, playthrough of Dwarf Fortress that uh, is going to focus on a lot of the basics but also is going to focus a lot, uh, a lot on various tips and tricks that I've learned through either playing the game or reading through the Reddit, various Reddit posts uh, or uh, discerning through uh, the wiki, which uh, can be a little bit obtuse sometimes. And now, uh, I do want to have a, a disclaimer right off the start. I've only been playing Dwarf Fortress for about a year, maybe a little less. And while it has become one of my favorite games, I am by no means an expert. There are still quite a few things that baffle me or that I have just not really delved into yet. Um, there are some other excellent tutorials out there. My own particular favorites are Captain Ducks and VG Paticuses, both of whom I will link in the description. This tutorial is not aimed at supplanting or replacing either of them, merely to supplement them. Uh, both of them I've found, uh, while informative, occasionally gloss over things that uh, can be quite useful or uh, just kind of rush a little bit in some areas. So I'm going to try and slow things down in some areas. Um, uh, like I said, this is kind of an introductory sort of video, so it's not going to be aimed at veterans, but more so at people who are just getting into the game. Obviously one of the biggest hurdles to playing Dwarf Fortress is the UI, which uh, uh, it lacks a lot of consistency. Those of us who've played it for a long time can uh, easily get around it, but for those, again, who are new players, occasionally it can be frustrating to try and muddle through. You know, most of the information contained in these tutorial videos will be most likely second nature to veterans of the game. You're not going to see me do a tutorial on more advanced things like pump stacks, obsidian casting, or even some of the basic stuff like aquifer piercing. Uh, none of those are really things I've ever gotten into. However, I do plan to spend a lot of time on the UI itself as well as a lot of the basic commands. And as I mentioned earlier as well, a few tips and tricks on things that I've learned uh, while playing. Now, I'm also going to do a, a similar video for Dwarf Therapist, which I will obviously cover in another video. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we're going to be starting off here in a new Embark. I've completely skipped over the Embark stuff for now. That's something that I'll, I'll delve into more later. I had actually previously recorded uh, some tutorial stuff, and unfortunately, uh, Camtasia recorder ate it, so I'm actually re-recording from where I was before. However, it's going to give me uh, hopefully a little bit more confidence in doing this. So to start off with, there are three very, very useful commands that I've noticed tend to get glossed over in other videos. These are commands that you're going to use a lot to gain information on your surroundings as well as items on the screen and units on the screen. Those three commands are look and view units and view items and buildings. So that's the hotkey K, the hotkey V, and the hotkey T. We're going to start with K for look. Now as you can see here on the side menu there is uh, all the basic main top-level commands, I guess, is the best way to put it. Each of these top-level commands will lead to more sub-commands. The first one we're going to look at, as I mentioned, is the look command, right here, K, look. K is extraordinarily useful. It'll give you a single square cursor that you can move around anywhere you want on the screen. You can move uh, using the number pad or the arrow keys. You can also use shift and the number pad or arrow keys and it'll move it in increments of 11 which will allow you to get around the screen a lot quicker. Now, whenever you hover the cursor over it'll tell you what is there, look, literally as if you were looking at it. For example, right here I've got it on this little tree symbol right there. It is telling me it is a large tree. That's awesome. What's this yellow thing right here? That is a shrub. 
What about this barrel-looking object over here? This is a dwarven ale barrel, made of ash. However, one other thing that uh, is to be noted is that if there's multiple things on a tile, it'll tell you everything in order. So there's a dwarven ale barrel made of ash. There is a food stockpile, which is the uh, texture right here. I'm sure everybody knows what a stockpile is by now. And below that is dense knot grass. So it's telling me basically in order what is on that square. Now I can look at each and every one of those items, I believe, except for the food stockpile. Okay, I can only look at one of the items. Um, now, as I was mentioning, each command has kind of a, a, a sub-level of commands. If we look down here at the bottom of this screen, you'll see what those sub-commands are. So if, if I'm hovering, or if I've got the uh, active line over the Dwarven Ale, bar ale Barrel, I can press enter to view it. So let's t do that. Now once I'm within this, it's telling me that there's Dwarven Ale there, how much it weighs, and there's a few other things I can do with it. I can d dump it, I can forbid it, I can hide it, I can let it look at its description. None of those are really all that interesting right now. You can use the plus and minus keys to scroll through the different items that are there. Some of them you can look at, some, some of them you can't. In this case, I can only look at the Ale, ale Barrel. Now, the look command will also tell you the uh, status of the square, specifically whether it's inside or outside, whether it's lit or dark, and whether it's above ground or below ground. Those can become important if you're delving uh, or if you're dealing with uh, creating farms especially, but in colder environments it'll also usually give you an indication on whether water is going to freeze or not. If you want to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, scroll down further, you can uh, go down to here. You can look at uh, the carpenter. I can use enter to look at him, and it'll take me to the um, the the stats menu, basically. Well, it's not really a stats menu; it's uh, a status menu, I guess, would be a better way of putting it. Uh, from this menu here, because it is a uh, object that is mobile, I can also follow them using control, or not control, shift F. And when I do that, it'll basically center the screen on him and wherever he moves, it'll follow him. So as you can see, the look command is very, very useful. Uh, I end up using it a lot. Sometimes it's just to move around the screen. Sometimes I do it to try and get more information on what's going on. Like here's another example. I can look at... Oh, actually, I can't look at the wagon. I'm trying to find a good example. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, well. Uh, if you hover over uh, empty space, it'll actually tell you it's empty space. There's uh, examples here as well. That's also empty space. Uh, downward slope, etc., uh, etc. Et so, yeah, keep, keep K in mind. K uh, will probably serve you very well. Now another one uh, is V. V for view units. This here specifically will view mobile units. Um, this is probably the best way to put it. You can use it to view uh, bad guys, you can use it to view your dwarves, neutrals, animals, everything. Now the interesting thing about it is because it only views basically mobile units, wherever you put your cursor it will basically be selecting the closest one of those applicable units. In this case I've got the cursor way up here, but it's selecting him because he's the closest unit. Now once you're uh, viewing a unit, you've got uh, a variety of sub-menus that you can use to gain further information. We're going to go with the dwarf here specifically. The dwarves, once you're viewing them, there's a lot you can do. This here is the general menu. Wh whichever menu you're on will be highlighted down here. There's the general, the inventory, the preferences, the wounds, and the status. Um, actually, status is an exception that I'll get to in a moment. So under the general, general menu, it'll tell you what their skills are, as well as what their current job is. In this case, this guy here is storing an item in a stockpile, and he's a novice brewer, a competent grower, and so on and so forth. You can use these lower... Um, selections here to basically filter which skills are being shown. Uh, with each one that is highlighted will indicate which ones are being are allowed to be shown in this list. So if I were to remove, if I were to press C, that would remove combat skills from the list because it makes it go dark. And if I removed, press B, it would remove labor skills. 
I went with this, it would remove all the miscellaneous ones, which would be things like uh, various social skills, primarily. Now, the next menu with dwarves is the inventory menu for I. Now, if you notice, the I is now lit up, the general is now darkened, and it's telling me the inventory. Now, you can scroll through the inventory, it'll show everything that they're wearing. This also includes water and blood, which is a little odd that they're considered inventory items, but if you want to find out uh, if somebody is, say for example, uh, covered in blood, you can go and look at their inventory and it'll tell you if they've got blood on them and what sort of blood. You can also look at individual items. Uh, say I want to look at what this alpaca wool cap looks like, I can just press enter and it'll tell me that it's a alpaca wool cap, its weight, who owns it, and I can look at its further description if I really wanted to, which I kind of don't actually. Next up is the preferences. Preferences is, is kind of an important one. Preferences has three major components to it. First off is the labors menu, which is up here, the L menu. You press that, and what you can do at this point is you can go through and select the various labors that you want this dwarf to do. Each category uh, will have their individual skills within it. Uh, there may be subcategories. Um, I'm not really sure because I don't usually use this particular menu. The reason why is because I use Dwarf Therapist, which is a much easier way of dealing with it. It is, however, there if you want to do it manually. You know, the other one you can use uh, on this particular submenu is the work animals. Go ahead and you press E, and you can assign any sort of war animals or training or uh, hunting rather animals to that particular dwarf, if there are any. In this case, there are not. Lastly, there is some squad information. You can use this submenu to assign a dwarf, particular dwarf, to a squad if you wish. Um, I'll deal more with that in the military tutorial. I rarely use this particular function, I more often use the military menu. Uh, it's easier to get a, a, an overview of what you're doing with that particular menu. Lastly is the wounds category. This here will tell you what is wounded and where. These are all color coded. White means that it's fine. And then there's, uh, I'm trying to remember here, there's kind of a, like a, a faded brown color which indicates bruising, a yellow color which indicates like cuts and deeper bruises, a red color which indicates more severe injuries like broken bones or nerve damage or organ damage, and then lastly if it's like, I don't want to say grayed out, but if it's like a, almost like a black color, that means that that particular item is missing. Like if left foot was blacked, uh, was a dark grayish black color, that means that the left foot had been cut off. Now. Right here we have the status, which is Z. This isn't actually a, a category within the view, it actually brings you to the status section. Uh, the status section is quite useful, but I'm going to deal with it a little bit more later. Now another thing about the view is that you can go and look at animals with them. Animals obviously are a, um, a mobile object for lack of a better term. Now, for the most part, it's the same thing as with the dwarves. General indicates their skills. Animals generally don't have skills. They generally don't have inventory either. However, under preferences, you can decide whether you want to slaughter them or not. If you have the, if you press S and get it ready for slaughter, then it'll be taken to a butcher shop and butchered for meat or whatever is uh, in it. Actually, I guess that would be just meat. Um, I usually don't use view on enemies, but I'm sure that you can use view on enemies to look at uh, their skills and their inventory and, and other such things as well. If we get any enemies, I will make sure to do that. Now the last one to look at that I was mentioning is the view items and buildings command, which is T. Now obviously you use this only to look at objects and buildings. Specifically, when you're moving your cursor around, it'll highlight the closest building, in this case the wagon. The wagon is considered a building, and it'll tell you what items are within that building. You cannot use K to look at uh, a building and see what items are in it, and you can't use K to look at items that are considered inside a building, uh, because they don't actually appear on the map. So you would use T to do that. Now in this case I'm looking at the wagon, as you can see the wagon is flashing highlighted on the screen here. And you can see here that the wagon has got plump helmet, spawn bag, 
cave wheat seeds bag, a bunch of meat barrels, actually a lot of meat barrels. And this is all stuff that is currently within that particular set of squares. If you notice that there is a TSK beside uh, this meat barrel, that means that that meat barrel is currently undergoing a task. In this case, uh, this means a dwarf is going to be picking it up and carrying it away to the stockpile. So if you're wondering if something is being moved or not, just look inside the um, building. If it's got a TSK beside it, that means that somebody is doing something with it. Now, lastly, like I said, uh, you can see what the building is made of. In this case, B indicates that that is what the building is composed of. In this case, it is composed of three pieces of high wood. The T, uh, the T command is not something you're going to use too, too often. Usually, uh, you'll use it if you're trying to find a specific item in a stock or in a workshop, or if you're trying to figure out the non-cheaty way what a dwarf with a mood wants for a uh, mood item. Uh, one thing you can do is you can somewhat manipulate the items inside the building. That is used with the submenu commands down here. There is uh, enter to view it. In this case, you know, you could, I could hit enter and it's telling me it's a meat barrel. It's got giant thrips meat in it. Uh, and it's weight of 14, uh, I guess, pounds or whatever that's supposed to be. However, the other uh, commands include forbid. So I could say, I don't want this willow barrel of meat touched, so I could go ahead and forbid it. That'll put the little forbid symbols on it. In this particular uh, key set, it's the curly Q brackets. And that means that that item is now forbidden. I can go ahead and reclaim it with the same button, which is F. I can also select it to be dumped. And that'll put a little purple D beside it. Now, if an item is selected to be dumped, it'll be taken to the nearest garbage, um, the nearest garbage zone, and dropped there. As it currently stands, I don't have any garbage zones, so that would be useless. But it also means, because it's selected to be dumped, that it won't be taken to a stockpile. It's kind of like forbidding it, but not quite. Now, if it was a metal item, I could also select it to be melted with the M button. Uh, an example is uh, down here. We had an iron anvil. So I could go ahead and I could select that iron anvil to be melted at a smelter. That'll put a little M beside it. And that means that it won't be moved anywhere except for to the smelter to be melted. In this case, I don't want that to be smelted, so I'm going to uh, unselect it for melting. Uh, you can also use uh, X to remove the building. If you do that, then that will basically have somebody come over with the appropriate skill to deconstruct the building. Uh, when you do that, any items that are inside of it will be spread out around it. Uh, it's kind of like having a shopping bag full of groceries and then slicing it open and having everything dump out. Uh, the hide command allows you to hide objects within the uh, within the the building. It's not again something I use very often. Uh, hiding it will basically mean that if it were to appear on the map, it won't appear on the map. Some people use the hide command to hide all sorts of stone. Um, I think it might help FPS, but I'm not sure on that, because the stone is still there, it's just not visible. That's something that uh, I may have to look into and get back to you all later. What it does do, though, however, is that it makes it not visible so that you don't have to see it. You can go ahead and hide all sorts of rock, and it'll just look like the rock is not there. Again, it's not something I use. I like to actually be able to see what's what and where, but some people like to use it. Now those are the three main viewing commands for units on the screen. Units, buildings, and objects. Next I'm going to talk a little bit about designations. Designation is basically the workhorse of Dwarf Fortress. Anytime you want to do any sort of digging, anytime you want to do any sort of tree cutting or picking of uh, wild plants, um, anytime you want to set an area uh, set a group of objects to be dumped or forbidden, you're going to use the designations command. Now over here on the main menu you'll see D for designation. Let's go to that menu now. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these in this episode, however I will um, go over uh, a couple of them. Now we have the mine command. The mine command is probably the most used designation. You're going to use that to do any sort of mining, obviously, because it's called the mine. Now, similarly is the channel command. 
channeling, if you designate an area to be channeled, and actually I'll show you an example. I uh, press H for channel. You can't use anything to scroll through this particular menu, unfortunately. So you actually have to press the hotkey. In this case, channel hotkey is H. Now, as an example of channeling, I'm going to select a, I don't know, uh, 5 by 3 area for channeling. Uh, is that five? Yeah. Now, it'll come up with this symbol here. What that means is that the dwarves who are going to do the channeling are going to come over here, and they're not going to dig the area in front of them. They're actually going to dig the area below that space. So the dwarf will come over here, and he will dig a hole in the ground right there. Now, this has a lot of uses. Uh, you can use it to create moats. You can use it uh, to easily create moats, I should say. You can use it to expand, um, uh, like, little ponds. You can expand their size a little bit. Uh, you can use it to uh, do a lot of terraforming. The key, though, is that it is digging from downwards from above. Now, if I were to have my miners dig this out, it'll dig it all out as a pit, but around the edge, it'll leave these little symbols here which are uh, up ramps. Well, actually, technically, these are down ramps. If you look at these, it'll leave these on the on the lower level. These are up ramps. These are down ramps. So it'll leave ramps around the side so that people can go in and out of that pit area. Now, the channeling command is awesome, and I do use it a fair amount, uh, usually for terraforming. You do have to be really, really careful, though, when you're uh, doing your channeling, because it's very, very possible and very, very easy to cause cave-ins with channeling. Now, I'm going to delve more into the channeling command later, and I'll get into the ins and outs of using it and of avoiding cave-ins and the like later. I just wanted to give a, an example of mining versus channeling. Now, you can also use the designated commands to, dig, uh, to remove stairs and ramps. This will specifically remove upstairs and up ramps. You cannot use this to remove downstairs. You cannot use this to remove down ramps. Down ramps, in fact, don't really exist as an object or an item. They exist as a indicator. You could not go and remove this down ramp, but what you could do is you could go and remove this up ramp, which will basically also remove the down ramp. Again, you can also use that to remove stairs. It doesn't remove downstairs, only upstairs. So I couldn't use it to remove these stairs, but I could come here to remove some of these stairs. You can also use the designations to to indicate areas that you want dug into upward stairs, downward stairs, up-down stairs, which are kind of like spiral stairs maybe, or upwards ramps. Now, digging out stairs or digging out ramps is significantly different from uh, building upward stairs and downward stairs and upward and downward stairs and upward ramps. Uh, this here requires you to have uh, material there. So, for example, I could not say I'm going to build a upward stair right here. It won't do anything. I hit, I double entered, and there's nothing there because there is literally nothing there that could be used to make that upward stair. However, if I was to go down here and I wanted to make a upward staircase out of this wall, because there is something there, there is a wall there. I can now designate that area to create an upward stair. So basically my miners would come over with their mining picks and literally carve that wall into the shape of a stairway that goes up. With building stairways, I'm going to remove that first. With building stairways using the building command, it actually is the opposite. It requires nothing to be there, and then the person building the stairs will bring material over and build the stairs out of the material. So there is a, there is a significant difference between the two. You can also use it, like I said, to do uh, chopping of trees and gathering of plants. In this case, if I want to chop trees or gather plants, I would select either T for uh, chopping down trees, P for plants, and I would go in and I'd mark the area that I want de dealt with. So if I was to chop down, wanted to chop down these trees, I could mark uh, uh, the start of my rectangle there, the end of my rectangle there, and it'll designate those trees to be chopped down with a different color. And then the first person with uh, the tree chopping labor that is available will come over and start chopping down the trees. Same thing with the gathering plants. If I want to gather the plant, I hit P, and then I designate an area. Usually it only chops down shrubs and similar things. 
So, like, it wouldn't deal that because that is a, um, a sapling. You actually can't use the chopping trees to chop down saplings either. I should note. These here are shrubs, so the the um, herbalist would go and pick those. And one thing to note about uh, mining and tree chopping and plant gathering, when you designate an area for them, like this, it always stops, starts rather, in the upper left corner and then works its way downwards. So I'm going to give you another example here with tree top, tree chopping. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start and designate this area here to be tree chopped. Now, even if your dwarves were over here, or right here, they're not going to wander over and start chopping these trees down. They're actually going to wander over and start chopping this tree down first. And that's because it is the upper leftmost tree. And it'll then move to this one, and then this one, and then this one, this one, this one, and then go all the way up here and chop them down in that order. It's the same with mining. If there's a way for a, a dwarf to get to the upper left corner for mining, it'll actually start over in the upper left corner to do the mining and then work its way down. Uh, channeling is the same way, and you can, uh, when you're digging and channeling especially, uh, you want to be careful with that, because if you designate it in the wrong areas, you can again cause cave collapses, uh, which can injure or kill your dwarves. It's no fun at all to be channeling out an area and then drop a, a section of ground on top of the dwarves beneath it and kill them. It's, it's pretty horrible. Now other designations include smooth stone and engraved stone. These are both done by a stone detailer. Smoothing the stone will take naturally occurring stone and smooth it out so it looks nice and smooth and pretty. It'll look just like built walls. So for example, I would come down here to these walls here and I could designate with the S button that I want this area here to be smoothed. That'll give it a designation like that when you're in the smooth menu. And once it's smoothed out, it'll look like a built wall. Now the nice thing about that is then you can go ahead and engrave it. And engraving it will obviously take the stone detailer and he'll start engraving the wall with his chisels and other tools and carve you know pictures into it and stories into it. And that'll increase the wealth value of that particular wall, which will give an overall increase to the value of the room and of the fortress itself. Uh, those are uh, fairly important, but they're also things that I generally don't do early, so it's something I'll come back to later. One thing to note, though, is you cannot do engravings on built walls. So if you go and designate walls to be built, rather than uh, natural walls to be smoothed, you cannot engrave them. I'm not sure why that is. I think that's an oversight that should be fixed, um, but I guess uh, Tony probably has his reasons for it. Now, once the wall is smoothed out, you can also carve, carve fortifications into it, which is this one here. Fortifications, um, it's basically like having like arrow slits uh, carved into walls, so that if you have fortifications, people can see through it, and archers can shoot through the, the holes in the walls, and it'll also allow liquids to pass through, like water and lava. Uh, again, it's something a little more advanced that I will delve into a little bit later. Now you can carve tracks. Um, I'm going to be honest, I've never used this and I don't know what carving tracks is for. And it's something I will look up and get back to you all on sometime in the future. Toggling engravings. If you have engravings on by default and then you have an area engraved, all of the squares will have these little symbols on it to represent what sort of engraving is on it. And it starts to get really distracting and really messy to look at. So you can toggle engravings, and basically when you're toggling engravings, you select an area like you would normally with the designation. And then any engravings that are in that area basically disappear. It's like hiding them. And that way you can see all the blocks underneath it, whether there's dwarves moving around, whether there's furniture there. Usually toggle engravings, usually engravings are turned off to start with, so that they're there but you can't actually see them. But sometimes it'll get uh, toggled on by mistake in the uh, configuration. Now remove designation is something I've been using a little bit here the last few minutes. And that's basically the X command. Remove designation, X. If I have these areas here toggled for um, chopping down trees, or designated for chopping down trees, but then I decide I don't want this tree here done, I just go to remove designations, select over it, and it's no longer being selected to be chopped down. You can do that one at a time or in an area, however you wish. And you do that to remove any sort of designation that you've previously done as long as it has not already been 
accomplished. In remove construction, you use this to remove constructed items. You would use it to designate. Say you had, say I had a wall right along the edge of this um, uh, stockpile here, so, but then I decided that I wanted to make a door in it. I would go ahead and I would select remove construction, and it would designate the spot that I want where that uh, opening to be. And then doors would come over, and they would just basically bash down that section of the wall. Uh, it is time consuming. It's one of the the longer things for a dwarf to do. Um, but sometimes you, you need to do it. Um, I'll probably show more examples of that later when uh, I actually have constructions and I'll, I'll show some examples. Now set building and item properties. This here is the menu that, whoops, is the menu that you use if you're wanting to designate items to be dumped or melted or removed or hidden or anything like that or reclaimed for example. This here is done for en masse. Say I decided I wanted to go and forbid all of these barrels to be used, to be touched. I'd go to the designations menu, and then I'd go into the set building item properties, which is B. Then I would go to F for forbid items and buildings. And then I could go and I could designate like that. Now all those buildings, all those uh, barrels are now a green color. That means that they've been forbidden. Nobody will go and touch them. Nobody will go and use them or anything that's inside of them. If I want to un uh, unforbid them, I can hit C for reclaim, and I can go and reclaim them. If I wanted to dump the item, or if I wanted to dump the barrels themselves, same thing. I'd hit the D button, go select them. Now they're a purple color, which means that they're selected to be dumped. If I want to remove uh, if I want to stop them from being dumped, I can't go and reclaim because they're not forbidden. I do have to, however, use the remove dump command, which is the capital D, and that'll change them from being uh, dumped status to an undumped status. And then, of course, like I said, you can use hide and unhide. I'll just demonstrate that here now. This is an example of hiding items. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hide these barrels. So now that they're blue, if I leave the designations menu, they're now no longer there. Now they are they do still exist there and dwarves will still go and use them. I just am not gonna see them there. Some people, like I said, will use that to remove the clutter of stones in an area. It's not really something I like to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna unhide those. Uh, it's capital H. Now one thing that some people get confused about is dumping items out of items. Now this here can be a little bit confusing. If I wanted my dwarves to, to go to this barrel and dump the lie out of it, but keep the barrel. I would go and I would select dump items, uh, D. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the dump items. I'm going to select it to be dumped. It is now pink and it is going to be dumped. However, I don't want the barrel to be dumped. I just want the stuff in the barrel to be dumped. So then I would use the look command, which is K. And I would go up to it and I would go inside it. Now, Inside it's indicating that there's a lie. I can look at the lie, and if you look at the lie, see there's a lie here, so it means I'm looking at the lie. The lie is selected to be dumped. So what you want to do is you want to go out here so that you're back at the barrel. So this, this indicates uh, up at the top, indicates what item you're currently looking at. You select D. Now the little purple D that was here is going to disappear. That means that the barrel is no longer being selected to dump. Let's go look at the lie again. Now, I am looking at the lie, as you can see by the top, however, it still has the D. That means that a dwarf is going to come and take the barrel and dump the lie out of it and then put the barrel back. Now, the dumping uh, of items out of items is the same way that you would go about dumping items off of creatures captured in a cage. I will have to demonstrate that more specifically later when I actually have some of those because there's a couple of extra steps in there, but it's the same sort of principle. Now, I am going to do a couple of little demonstrations of the mining designation, because the mining designation is one that is used the most, and for brand new players, it's one that might also be a little on the confusing side. Now, we're going to go back up to the surface here. On the surface, you can't mine anything, because as I indicated previously, there's nothing there. There's nothing there to mine. This is literally a flat section of grass. If there was a wall there, I could probably mine it. What I can do is I can craft downward stairways. Downward stairways is J. J get used to that. J is one you're probably going to use a lot of. 
If I wanted to go ahead and designate some downward stairways right here, I would go like that. That there, I'm designating a 2x2 two two stair. And it doesn't have to be 2x2. Two two. You can go 3x3, three three, you can go 4x4, four four, you can go 5x5, five five, any size you want. Uh, you can actually even get a little bit fancier with the remove designations command. For example, say I wanted to dig a a 3x3 three three staircase, but I wanted to leave the middle out. Um, somebody, uh, I think it's Captain Duck does this, where he'll build a section of stairs and then remove the middle portion and put a statue there. That's a really good idea. Uh, if it's a nice statue, they'll, uh, doors will gain happy thoughts every time they go past it. To do that, you do something like this. You designate a 3x3, three three, and then you use the remove designation and remove the middle piece. So they'll dig it, the stairs around it, but they'll leave that middle spot untouched. Now, I've already got an area dug out, and I'll show you that here. So, these here, these X's, represent up-down stairs. It means that a dwarf can go up or down on them. It's very important to have these um, between levels like this. Makes it a little bit easier to travel from area to area. Now, here's an example of some designations that I had previously done that uh, I haven't actually started mining out yet. Uh, for those of you who've been watching my more recent uh, Dusk Earth videos, you know I like to put this little quasi-airlock section around my central staircase. It gives me a, a way to block off the central staircase in case of invasion. Now, these, these are all examples of mining designations. I go and I would select mine, and then I would go and select what I wanted to have mined out like that, and it colors it in like this color here on this particular um, text... Uh, texture pack, it uses this color, and this means that the dwarves are going to go and they're going to mine out those particular squares. You can use a combination of the mine and the remove designation to do all sorts of really weird and wondrous uh, shapes and designs. Uh, I'm not usually uh, one who will go out of their way to make really, really weird designs, but there's an entire section on the Dwarf Fortress forums, and I think on the wiki as well, about different sorts of fractal-based um, mining designs for, like, bedrooms and storerooms and, and that sort of thing. I tend to be a little bit more simplistic in my designs. I find them tend to be, well, they're not necessarily super aesthetic, they're, they're fairly efficient, and when you're recording, you want to keep uh, hits to the FPS as low as possible. So this is how mining would work. For stair designation, these stairs obviously got dug out already, but I'll just go show you a quick example of how I went and designed those. So first off, I know I want to do a 2x2 two two stair in the middle and a outer area around it to give uh, the dwarves a little bit more space to move around in. So this here, uh, this outer area is obviously 4x4, four four, so I would have went something like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's a 4x4. Four four. However, I wanted to spend multiple z-levels. In this particular version, and newer, uh, more recent versions of Dwarf Forges, you could designate mining and other things over multiple z-levels. So what I would do is I would start there, move my cursor down to here, because I know that's 4x4, four four, and then I would scroll up or down as many squares as I wanted to do the mining. And now you'll see that it is designated over multiple z-levels. However, they can only access one z-level at a time without stairs. So what I would do so I would find the center, which is where I want the stairs to go. Go something like this. I want to build a downward stair here. So they would go ahead and build that downward stair, and then that would lead them into this room, and then dig out this room. However, it would leave them just stuck on this room, and they would have no way to get out. So you would also want to designate either upward stairs, or, because this is supposed to be a central core, you'd want to designate up downstairs so they can go up and down. So I'm going to designate up downstairs, which is I. And again, you can do it over multiple z-levels, so I'd go something like that, find out find out where I want it to end, and because I want to put an upstairs here, not an up-downstairs, I would go back one z-level, like that. As you can see, there's an upstairs designation there, up-down stairways there, so they'll be able to dig out the stairs and all the areas around it. Then at the bottom, I would set a section for upstairs, and when they got to the bottom, they dig out those upstairs, which would allow them to go up and down whenever they want. Now, one thing that I hadn't uh, talked about previously, which I should have, uh, and I apologize for those uh, people who are watching who are fairly new to the game, the game is sort of 3D, but because it's a top-down view game, you 
can't normally see every level at once. To be able to scroll between levels, uh, you use the greater than and less than sign on your keyboard. That is to say, shift comma and shift period. Shift comma, or the, uh, I think that's the less than sign, will take you upwards Z levels. The shift period, or greater than sign, will take you downwards Z levels. This way you can uh, flip between Z levels with ease, like a pro, like a master. So I'm going to end this first episode here. Um, it's been a fair amount of information to take in for new people. For those of you who are long players of the game, you'll probably be bored by this point. But uh, this is made more for the newbies anyways. I will go into more interesting things uh, in future episodes. So thanks guys for watching, and I hope you come back. Take care.